In this video, we're going to introduce VSEPR theory. Now, VSEPR is an acronym that stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. And this is a useful way to predict the three-dimensional structure for different molecules, right? So the previous unit we spent learning about drawing Lewis structures, figuring out the bonding pattern in different molecules, and drawing these molecules, drawing a visual representation of these molecules. But we're drawing them on a two-dimensional plane and molecules are inherently three-dimensional objects. So the second part of this localized electron model is figuring out the three-dimensional structure for the molecule once you have the representative Lewis structure. So I have a few three-dimensional structures here, right? This is what we're after. We wanna figure out what the three-dimensional structure for our molecule is. Now, the basics of VSEPR theory are relatively simple. Um, if you wanted to do this fully, like if you wanted to calculate the minimum energy structure for a molecule, um, you would have to have some sort of energy function, you would have to minimize that function. It would be a really computationally intensive task. VSEPR theory is a way to simplify this task in a way that just uses, you know, just the Lewis structure and the relative placement of the atoms. So the general idea behind VSEPR theory is that for every molecule, you'll have some sort of central atom or central location that you can focus on. And that central atom is going to have electron groups attached to them. Now, I drew them here as lone pairs, but they could be bonds as well. Right. They could be double bonds, triple bonds, what have you. Right. Any electron group that is around a central atom. Since electrons are negatively charged particles, they're going to repel each other. Right. So basically what Vesper theory says is that, OK, these electron groups around the central atom are going to repel each other and orient themselves in such a way that they minimize that repulsion. Right? They're going to want to be as far apart as possible because this electron repulsion is very unfavorable to the structure. It's going to drive the energy up. Right. So what they're what molecules are always trying to do is is orient these electron groups, whether they're lone pairs or bonds, orient those electron groups in such a way that it minimizes this unfavorable electron repulsion. Right now, in order to do that, we're going to have to calculate something called the steric number. steric number which i will often abbreviate as sn right so what the steric number does is very simple calculation and, and basically it's going to determine the number of electron groups that are around a specified central atom so the steric number sn is going to be equal to the number of atoms bonded to the central to the central atom right so number of atoms bonded to the central atom, right? So regardless of whether it's a double bond or a triple bond or a single bond, how many atoms are bonded to that central atom? We'll look at that in more detail that really double bonds and triple bonds will be treated as the same. Um, but for now, just the number of atoms that are bonded to the central atom plus the number of lone pairs bonded to the central or the number of lone pairs on the central atom. Number of lone pairs on the central atom. Right, so this is going to be your equation for the steric number. So first you're going to identify what is the central atom and then you're going to calculate the steric number from there you will figure out the um, you will figure out the steric number for that uh, that central atom, and then you can use that steric number in order to predict the overall molecular geometry. So, if you have a steric number of two, let's say you have a steric number of two, that's going to be a linear geometry. These are going to be the base geometries for each individual steric number. So, um, so, and really what we're, what we're going to do here first, we're not going to worry about lone pairs. I'll deal with that in the next video, in the next lecture, 
But um, for now, let's consider that all of these attachments and contributions to the steric number are actual bonded atoms. If you've got two bonded atoms, then the structure is going to be linear. So I've shown a linear uh, molecule here. This is carbon dioxide, CO2. And basically what's going to happen here is that the central carbon is going to have these two atoms um, attached to it. And they're going to orient themselves in a linear fashion to get the maximum separation between these electron groups, right? The, the bonded oxygens. So that 180 degree angle is a result of minimizing this electron repulsion between the electron groups, right? So for example, they wouldn't orient themselves in this way. Like let's say that this was the structure of carbon dioxide, right? Let's say we had something like this, I don't know. Let's do something like that, right? Let's say there's like a 120 degree angle here, right? This is gonna have a high degree of electron repulsion, right? This guy's gonna be repelling against these, right? That's gonna be a large degree of repulsion. Whereas here, the electron repulsion between those groups has been minimized, right? So that's the whole game here is how do you orient the molecule in such a way that the electron repulsion is minimized? Okay, so let's move on to a higher steric number, steric number of three. If you have a steric number of three, then the geometry is going to be trigonal planar. Right, so this is an example of a trigonal planar geometry. This is CH2O, right? Um, so basically these electron groups are gonna orient themselves such that these bonds are 120 degrees apart, minimizing the electron repulsion. Moving on, if you have a steric number of four, that's going to be tetrahedral, right? And the tetrahedral geometry, an example of that here is given in methane, uh, CH4, which has a tetrahedral geometry. These bonds are going to orient themselves where the bond angle is 109.5 degrees all around, minimizing the electron repulsion between the different groups. Steric number five gets you a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. So trigonal bipyramidal, oops, bipyramidal, right? So a trigonal bipyramidal geometry is basically, so you can think of these atoms as the different vertexes to the, uh, to two pyramids stacked on top of each other, right? So you would have, you know, one pyramid on top and one pyramid on the bottom. And so you're going to have some of these angles will be 90 degrees between some of these bonds. And then others will have this 120 degree trigonal planar shape. In fact, you can kind of think of it as a linear molecule that's kind of bisecting a trigonal planar shape, right? So this middle shape is trigonal planar. And then that um, linear shape is like bisecting that. And if you have a steric number of six, then you will have an octahedral geometry, right? And SF6, which is shown here, is the poster child for octahedral geometries. And basically all of these six bonds around the central atom will orient themselves where the bond angle is 90 degrees, giving maximum separation between each of these, um, between each of these uh, bonds here, each of these electron groups. Okay, so this is just if all of them, uh, all of your electron groups are actual real atom attachments, actual bonds, right? Lone pairs are gonna change the game. And that's what gonna be the focus of the next lecture. But before we end this one, I do wanna uh, kind of point out that this presents a bit of a unique conundrum here for us, just as a visual representation. We're constantly trying to draw things on two dimensional planes, either paper or a whiteboard. Um, and we're drawing these things in two dimensions, but we're trying to represent a three dimensional shape. So in order to do that, we introduce something called the dash wedge notation. So dash wedge notation, right? And so, uh, what the dash no dash wedge notation does is allows us to represent three dimensional objects on a two dimensional plane. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's take methane here, for example, CH4. You'll notice that these uh, three atoms are all in the plane, right? These two bonds are in the plane. 
So we can draw those just like we would for any other Lewis structure, right? We got CH, right? So we put those guys in the plane. However, we want, we have these two bonds that if we're looking in the plane, one is coming out of the screen at us and the other one is going into the screen, right? So we use a wedge, what we call a wedge, which is just going to be a bold bond here to represent the hydrogen coming out of the board at us. And we use a dash to represent the hydrogen going into the board, right? So this would be a two-dimensional representation of a tetrahedral geometry so for CH4, right? We've represented the hydrogens that will be in the plane. And then the ones that are coming in and out of the board are represented as dashes and wedges. Let's do the same thing here for SF6, right? Because you'll notice that these two bonds, again, in the plane, and then these four bonds are out of the plane. So how would we represent SF6? Let me use a different color here. So we would have our sulfur central atom, and we would have this fluorine that's, uh, bond that's in the plane, this fluorine bond that's in the plane, and then everything else is going to have to be a dash or a wedge, right? So we'll have two of these fluorines going into the board, and then two of these fluorines coming out of the board. Right. And that's how you would represent SF6, right? A three dimensional geometry where you have some bonds going in and out of the board using the dash wedge notation. Let's do the, the um, trigonal bipyramidal um, shape just for completeness here. Right. So this is PF5. So you'll have the phosphorus uh, in the plane. Again, these two phosphorus fluorine bonds are still in the plane as well. And this third one. Right. All that stuff is in the plane. Then you've got one fluorine here going uh, into the board and then one coming out of the board. All right. So those are all of the ones that would require us to use the dash wedge notation. Right. So uh, if you wanted to draw CO2, right, you would just have CO2. Right. So you wouldn't include the uh, you wouldn't have to use dashes or wedges there because it's just a planar molecule. Same thing for trigonal planar. But anything else is going to require us to use the dash wedge notation. OK, so that's just a primer introduction for Vesper theory and representing these two dimensional molecules. Um, well, three dimensional molecules on a, a 2D plane. Um, the next video is going to show you how lone pairs are going to change the game here, right? All of these, uh, all these examples that I've shown here, the central atom does not have any lone pairs around it. I'll show you in the next video how lone pairs around a central atom are going to change the shape in Vesper theory.